Hello, this is Elsa, and today I am delighted to have with me Laura Knight Yachik, who has been on a quest for truth, I would think almost all her life, and it's been an incredibly interesting journey. I particularly wanted to interview her for two reasons. One, she has also been interested in someone whose work I incredibly admire. The work is called Political Panerology, and she has written a foreword to it. But more than that, she has really looked everywhere for truth herself and has been willing to face that evil plays a role. And then she's looked at what is reality, but I do not want to start there because I am really interested as well in who is the person. Who is this person, this little girl once long ago, Laura? And did she have the seeds of the woman? Was she already questioning? Yes, she was conventional, but was she not an average conventional, you know, accepting things person? So I'd love to start with you as a child and then your journey and how you found things and what you found, all of that. So it's all yours, Laura. Oh, well, you mean I don't get a specific question to respond to? Well, it is specific. Who are you? Uh, I like to think of myself as just an ordinary person uh, who dreams of a better world and wants to understand why this one isn't better because I, I have the idea that if you understand why something is the way it is, then you can figure out how to fix it. You know, you, you can't fix something you don't understand. So, therefore, I would like it to be a better world. I would like to be instrumental in helping to make it a better world. Uh, therefore, I want to understand why it is the way it is. You know, why are we the way we are? Why is Earth the way it is? Why are, you know, do we have meaning in life? Uh, you know, all the, all the basic questions that great philosophers and ordinary people have asked, you know, for millennia. You know, why is it the way it is? And, and if it's not acceptable, can we fix it? So that's... Were you asking those questions as a little girl, even looking around you? Uh, I think I was, I, I think I was a retarded child, <laughs> I swear. <laughs> Sometimes I think I really, I mean, I was intellectually very, very bright. I read at a very early age and I was in advanced classes throughout, you know, my school years and all that sort of thing. But, you know, in, a, in, a, in another sense, I was really retarded. Because, and probably because I lived in this intellectual world. I preferred the world of books, and I lived in the world of books almost exclusively for a long, long time. And I still, you know, retreat into the realm of books because that's where I do my research. You know, that's where I extract the information. But, of course, now I go into it with questions. Then I went into it, well, actually with curiosity, just general curiosity. And, and the things that I read most when I was growing up were, were histories, uh, historical novels or, you know, actual historical uh, volumes about history, um, historical periods, um, anything like that, you know, I very much, very much enjoyed. I, I liked reading old diaries and they had a number of old diaries, like from the French Revolution or from the American Revolution, that sort of thing. I would read those. And I would uh, try to get inside the heads of the people who were writing them because, of course, they were writing about things that were, were to us now, from a, a, a perspective, you know, were dramatic. But they were living in them at the time, and to them it was just what was happening around them. And then, of course, if you transpose that to today, we are all living in this time, and it seems like it's just what's happening, but... You know, who knows if 100 or 200 years from now, it might be considered, you know, some dramatic turning point in history. And somebody would very much like to read somebody's diary about the daily events. So, yeah, that's what I, but socially I was, I was retarded because I didn't, uh, uh, my family was a little peculiar. Yeah. yeah. In what way? Well, my grandfather was, uh, was an engineer, and he raised me and my brother mostly. Um, and he uh, he worked from an office in the house, 
and then he would travel to where the jobs were and you know work there because he was a mechanical engineer and he specialized in marine uh, engineering and it was a requirement for the us to be very quiet when he was working because his nerves were not good and his nerves were not good because of World War One. I. I only found that later, but that's what it was. And so we had to be very quiet and we learned to be very quiet. And so we were very quiet. We weren't loud. We weren't raucous. Uh, my brother and I both were readers and we just, and my grandfather didn't, uh, his nerves didn't uh, accommodate social life so to say he and he wasn't a social person he himself was a person who lived in his head so uh maybe you could say he was nowadays they would say a little bit autistic but i would just say that he was you know driven and uh focused on his work and um very creative in that way so it was just kind of a strange household because we had to be quiet and we weren't sociable that was it so but I you know, can see it gave you a fantastic foundation for your intellectual interests, for the passion for history, the passion for people, for questioning. Because I listened to a very long interview with you over two hours, and I was struck by how you kept questioning and going further. How you early on got married, had four children, and then had a bedridden time. And during that time, you were anything but helpless in your brain. You were questioning, questioning, questioning. And from that interview, I also learned that you had grown up traditionally Christian, very a conventional person. So there was nothing in your early environment to make you question that outlook. But already, as far as you could question, as far as, as, far as you could learn things, you were doing it. And this has been a hallmark. And in fact, I have noticed this among some truth tellers, this curiosity, this questioning, this daring to go outside a limit for whatever reason. And in your case, you were already in many ways outsider. You were not somebody who had to learn, oh my God, I'll get kicked out of the herd if I do this, it seems. Yeah, I was definitely not part of the herd, and, and that continued because I had... Uh, you know, I had particular tastes already by the time I was, say, seven or eight years old. I, I liked to read. I liked uh, certain kinds of music. Uh, you know, w when music was played in our house, it was it was low. It was classical. It was, uh, you know, nothing nothing raucous, nothing nerve jangling, and uh, and I. Uh, I just, and, and my grandfather himself was a very strong character and he would say things that, you know, would impress me. He didn't, he didn't think much of what he called progress. And progress was a bad word, you know, because when they came in and, and progress, it always meant destruction of something because, you know, I grew up in Florida and progress meant, you know, building hotels on the beach, you know, destroying the wetlands, uh, uh, building these vast estates of little cardboard box houses and, uh, you know, getting rid of the natural beauty of things, you know, killing everything right and left. And, and so he didn't think much of of progress. And yet at the same time, you know, he was a mechanical engineer. So obviously he was building progressive uh, ships. So, um, yeah, it, it, was, it was kind of a dichotomy uh, in a lot of ways. So I didn't... Um, I didn't go with the herd at all because, you know, the, the herd was all about going with the progress, you know, the modern things, you know, I, I got this distaste for modern things, you could say. And so when the kids were all going wild over rock and roll music when I was in high school, you know, I'm listening to Bach and Beethoven. <laughs> and I'm thinking, huh. I did later acquire quite a, 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 an affection for what, what they now call classic rock. Uh, but at the time, it was it was the music of the kids. But that was only later, after high school, you know. And I would listen to it, and I would and I would listen to it, and I would say, well, you know, there, there's something actually melodic about that. It takes talent to produce that, you know. And I would kind of get inside it, you know. And uh, so I, I got an appreciation for um, for classic rock, and I'll listen to classic rock, and I'll listen to 50s music. But you know, 
mostly it's classical. I'd love to hear how your thinking progressed and also your reaching out and your writing because it's been incredibly interesting. It's also interesting to me that you haven't stayed a, a private person. Like some people like you might have just done thinking and, you know, on their own written journals and it didn't go anywhere. But you're somewhere all along. You've reached out to the world. And considering the situation we have right now, my belief is that we need people who reach out into the world in various ways, that we don't keep our insights to ourselves. So I'd love to hear your journey. It started out Christian. It didn't stay there. You expanded both your idea of what the universe was like, and then I would say it's the biggest four-letter word, evil. Yeah, well, it started out really, you know, I had some experiences as a child that really frightened me. And, um, you know, so the question of evil was always kind of, oddly enough, in the back of my head. And I, and my mother, you know, had experiences and she married several times. I had several stepfathers and, you know, and I would... And, and as I said, you know, we were a very religious household and we had a long line of, of uh, Christian ministers in the background on both sides of the family. So, I mean, one was Baptist, the other Methodist. I had landed on the Methodist side. Um, and, you know, I would, I read the Bible at a very early age and I thought that it was really, I mean, this is supposed to be the good book. You know, what are you talking about? And of course, even at that point, I didn't understand what some of the euphemisms that they used in the Bible were, but now I know what they are, and it's even more horrifying. <laughs> so, and I'm talking about the Old Testament here. Um, so, I, you know, here they're teaching this, and then I'm seeing this. And this was, this, this was the big thing for me, always. I would hear what people told me, and then I would observe and I'd say, you know, what they're saying is not what I'm seeing. You know, why? What's what's the problem here? If, if you're saying, and I would even say this as, as a child, to, like my grandmother, my grandfather, you know, you know, well, they all talk about love and so forth, but then they do this and this and this. You know, what? You know, that doesn't make sense because you know they're lying. You know, that 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 really bothered me. But you know, I did try to conform at a certain point um, after after high school and. And college, and then I had had my first child, and uh, I tried. I, at that point, I really tried to conform because I had a little person I was responsible for, and I knew I needed to conform more closely, and you know, get a real job, you know, make real money, live a real life, all of these normal things, because it was important, you know, to pr provide a stable foundation for children. So I really tried, and, you know, I was going along pretty good until, um, you know, I still had all these questions, and I still had this furious interest in, in the occult, what you would call the occult. The paranormal is actually a better word for it. Uh, so I was interested in the paranormal, and uh, there was an old, old gentleman who lived not far from us when I was growing up, 13, 14 years old. And he had the entire collection of the proceedings of the Society for Psychical Research from the, from the UK, from back in the you know the 19th century, you know, up, right up to when they stopped producing, if if they did. And I had access to this, and I read this stuff, and I read, and I read, and I read, and I read, and then and then he had a small library of other paranormal things. This was his mother's interest, and she had died and left him all these books. And I read all of these things, you know, so I had this tremendous interest. And I learned to do hypnotherapy, you know, when I was in college. Experimented with that, past life regression. There was a lot of things going on. It's not like I just went, you know, boom. But when, when I had my child, I decided I got to be normal. I can, I, you know, that's good enough for, uh, you know, when you're on your own and you don't have anybody to answer to. But, you know, now you got to get normal here because you got this kid, you got to, be straight and narrow. So I tried. <clears throat> and um, it lasted until, and I've told this story many times, uh, I was, I was, I don't know, I had maybe three children at the time. I had five, by the way, not four. And, uh, and believe me, it makes a difference. <laughs> so 
my ex-husband had a friend whose father was an army major, retired. And this old gentleman died. And his friend came to take care of the estate. And he came by our house. And he had a trunk in the back of his truck. And he said, you know, I'm getting taking care of all dad's stuff so mom can sell the house. And this was a trunk full of books. He says, and I know your wife likes to read. So here I thought she'd like these books, you know, go through them. If she doesn't want them, she can give them away. You know, if there's anything she wants to read. And in that trunk of books, I found the book, None Dare Call It Conspiracy. Mm. By Jerry Allen. I don't know if you're familiar with that book. No, but the word conspiracy. Wow. And I picked it up and it was basically about, uh, you know, conspiracy, government conspiracies to do things, you know, political or, um, you know, how, the, how we were run by a bunch of conspira conspirators, how the government was, was corrupt and they were doing all these things. I mean, you'd have to look at it. And I read this book. What was the year about? Uh, probably about... Mm. 1984, 85, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And it just blew my mind. I said, what in the world? And it just, it, it staggered me. Because here they were saying that our government was a bunch of corrupt criminals, essentially. And Everything, I mean, the wars were started to make money. The World War II itself, and I mean, you know, my father, my two of my uncles were in World War II. Um, it even referenced World War One and, and and these things. And I thought, you know, my uncle's life was destroyed by uh, World War Two. My grandfather's life was destroyed by World War One. Uh, you know, and they're saying that all of that was just to to feed the greed and Money, money, hunger for a bunch of, uh, you know, basically evil people, and that all of these things about patriotism and how they stir it up in a, in people with parades and flags and all this kind of stuff, that it's all a, it's all a, a plot to enslave people, and you know those kinds of things were basically what what he was talking about in this book, and I was thinking, my God, can that possibly be true? Because I didn't. I mean, it shocked me. It, it really, I mean, it's like, <clears throat> kind mm -hmm. of thing. Because, I, you know, patriotic, all this kind of stuff. And I said, can it possibly be true? And that's kind of what got the thing going on, on that line. You know, to find out what I could about all of these things. And I, this was not the time of the Internet either. Uh, at the same time, I was also doing a lot of research on health issues because... My uh, my daughter, my second daughter, had, um, well, they, they diagnosed her with being hyperactive, what they called it in those days, and, and, and they wanted to drug her with, you know, like uh, uh, barbiturates. And I decided, oh, well, I'm not going to drug my, my child. I mean, hell, I didn't even give my children vaccines, you know? And... So I'm not going to I'm not going to give her drugs. So I start, went to the public library and looked, you know, for things on on that topic. And I found a book, you know, talked about food additives and that sort of thing causing children to be hyperactive. So that started me on that line. So that's always running in the background. And the political thing was running in the background. And I started getting a little bit involved. You know, I was always reading the news, reading the paper. I would write letters to the editors, you know, and sometimes they would publish my letters. I would write letters to the governor. I wrote letters to the president. I would write letters to senators. You know, here's what's wrong, blah, 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 blah. You know, there would be problems with the school system. There would be problems with the welfare system. I worked for the, the state in the welfare system at one point. And that was another place where what they were saying in the newspapers and talking about welfare fraud and all that stuff was not what I was seeing in my office, you see. So, you know, I saw that the only welfare fraud that was really going on was people at the top levels, you know, who were who at particular case, they stole the plates to print food stamps, sold them on a black market, you know, for 10 cents on the dollar, you know, billions of them. 
but you know, the people were coming in sit, sitting across my desk from me, you know, really needed help. And it was very difficult to give it to them. And it was very stingy help. And I was there during the transition between the, uh, what was it, Reagan and Carter. Um, you know, the Reagan administration, you know, was very strict. And then Carter came in, all these, you know, new issues came down. We had a, a, a manual for how to do things, you know, about this thick. And then as soon as the Carter administration came in, you know, we get a new manual that's this thick. You know, all the rules are different now. You do everything different. So it was it was crazy. So I was doing all of that research. And then, of course, the event happened when I had my, uh, uh, my fourth child and I was laid up in bed. And that was when I, I subscribed to the AREs uh, library by mail. And then, you know, you get a catalog, all these esoteric books. I mean, God, I was in hog heaven. So I was sending for books and I was reading and taking notes and reading and taking notes like a like a mad woman. And that was when the whole channeling thing started. It, what I thought was because I would start you know, asking these questions and, you know, well, what does that mean? Or how could that be possible? You know, any kind of question you ask yourself when you're reading something and all of this stuff would start coming into my head, you know. But, uh, yeah, that was kind of where it went and how it got going and it just kept going from there and then after after we had our uh, channeling experiment which I've described in great detail in, in several books um, and I ended up divorcing my husband because he he just he couldn't handle the changes he couldn't you know he uh, he just couldn't go there mm -hmm. you know. This is, I think, a common thing if one person is making major developments. It's a minority of partners yeah, who can go the distance. Yeah, so anyhow, I ended up married to my, to my present husband. Uh, and we sat down and talked about it one day. You know, because at this point, I had started sharing this information with people. The reason I shared was because I wanted feedback. Mm -hmm. Because I had learned already at this point in time that you can't necessarily trust your own mind. And I learned that from doing hypnotherapy and, you know, just basically interacting with people myself and talking, you know, to various people. And that's a whole story in itself, how I came to that realization that you can't trust your own mind. You need feedback. You need other people to look at something and tell you what they see because what they see may be different from what you see mm -hmm. and they may see things you can't see. And I learned, you know, the and really the hard way that you can't see everything. One Including person. channeling. I'm, yeah. I'm agreeing with you that you may sure. channel things that are not accurate, that yeah. do not go with somebody else's view of things. Right. So I needed somebody to... Uh, to look at this so I was sharing it with people and we had quite a group that would meet once a week for that and then I started transcribing things and putting them up on online because by this time this was uh, 90s 97 98 you know the internet had come into being it was still not fully fledged but it was it was up and running and we created a website and we had it and that's when the attack began um, because it seems that what you just said, my channeling doesn't agree with somebody else's. Well, it seems that all of somebody else's who my channeling didn't agree with wanted to attack. And, uh, and they weren't the only ones. I mean, it was a whole lot of the new agey types who were all into channeling and they were channeling basically what amounted to love and light and everything is beautiful in its own way. And, you know, the galactic federation is here to save us and all the aliens are good. Everything's wonderful and blah, blah, blah. And my channeling wasn't saying that. And I, uh, so the New Age went after me. And of course, the Christians, you know, forget that, channeling, uh, work of the devil. And naturally, since my channeling went into some areas of science, then, you know, the scientific uh, materialist types, you know, you know, so basically I was still an outsider completely. And uh, that got pretty that got, that got pretty intense there for a while, and that was one of the things that led to me really 
and and I was still doing um, hypnotherapy at the time, and ended up doing some really um, uh, unpleasant hair raising uh, exorcisms. In yourself or in other people? For other people, you know. Mm-hmm. That I mean, when you when you have somebody under hypnosis and you basically you open them up and something else <laughs> looks out at you. <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> so, yeah, it was that was pretty scary, and uh, I decided, well, you know, I really need to understand this because I still was having trouble after all those years of all the things I'd learned, you know, about political shenanigans and you know, social shenanigans, and, you know, it all just looks like, you know, people are just greedy, and they get the love of the dollar gets to them, and that's all, you know, basically all it is to it. And, but I realized that there's something else, there's something else going on here, especially after this whole attacking mechanism went into play, because it, it had, it was like a dance, and I watched it like a dance. There were People who were like the ringleaders, people who were the cheerleaders, people who were the, you know, oh, well, I don't know if what you're saying is exactly, you know, let's ask. And then, you know, then the people that would shout them down and then they would, you know, get into the, you know, so it was was like watching a, a choreographed dance to see how this, these groups of people, and this was all taking place on the Internet, on discussion groups and discussion forums, to watch how they were leading and uh, leading or pushing or. Uh, bullying or, you know, any number of things you you could use to describe social behavior in these groups. And I started really, really studying it, and I kept reading and reading. And, of course, I came across the problem of uh, psychopathy because it seemed to me that there was something wrong with some of these people. There was, and, and And the other thing that was really apparent was they were all pretty much the same. They may have had different words and different agendas, but their patterns of behavior were like almost identical. And they weren't very creative, but they were very confident. And it was their confidence that amazed me because, you know, I'm, I was not terribly confident about anything. I want people to, you know, look at this with me and let's talk about it and come to a, a conclusion. And, I want, you know, feedback and I want more data, you know, because I don't want to say something that's wrong. I don't want to say something that's hurtful. I don't want to say something that takes people in the wrong direction. But these people were absolutely confident. And I was watching these absolutely confident people who were lying through their teeth with such confidence. I couldn't imagine how can a person do that? But it's a tendency of everyone to project their own inner state on other people. <laughs> And since I couldn't imagine feeling that kind of confidence if I didn't know something for sure or if there was something that was not true, I couldn't imagine how they could do it, you know. So I I had to really, really get into it. So I I studied the psychopathy and I started writing about it. Of course, I was concerned about it in terms of, of social interactions. And then the more obvious thing that came along was the appearance of, by this time, I had a lot of psychopathy studies under under my belt. You know, I studied psychopathy for 10 years. I mean, just concentrated. And I, I have realized, a question, and that is, there's psychopathy, deliberate evil, you know, with total confidence and saying it as if truth. I have also met, especially in the New Age movement, people who seem to be totally deluded, like they really believe in the love and the light and the blah blah, and it makes no sense. It's totally disconnected from reality. How did how do you see it? Do, I mean, there can be a psychopath behind them feeding them, but they do not seem to me psychopathic. Um, they seem very very dangerous. I mean, I see the whole New Age movement is extremely dangerous, but I don't. I would really be fascinated with your take on psychopathy and the New Age movement? Well, there's a, certainly a lot of it because psychopaths look for any kind of environment where they can become an authority, take charge, 
um, and fleece people of whatever they can fleece them of, whether whether they want adulation, which you know partly they want, but whether they want if it, narcissism goes goes with it, and they want money or they want goods or they want services, uh, but mostly they want power over other people. And that's why it's, it's a tricky thing because there's a type of psychopath that uses pity to acquire power. Mm -hmm. They seem so pitiful and not confident, you see. But by doing these pity ploys, they gain, gain power over other people and have all these people, you know, dancing to their tune, you know, serving them and doing all this sort of thing. So that's a particular type of psychopath. But, yeah, and... As to as to could you tell the difference? Probably not. How how do you know they're not psychopaths? Because the psychopath, I mean, that's the one thing that Herbie Cleckley brought, you know, really sharply to our attention was their mask of sanity. They seem more normal than normal itself. They are more real than we are. They they have you know, charm, they have the gift of gab, of conversation, they have, you know, abilities to uh, to do things that make you feel confidence in them, uh, to say the right thing at the right time. You know, this is if they're putting their attention on something. It slips, obviously, from time to time. But there are so many people who are like that, who... You'd never know it unless you lived with them inside the house. And even in that case, that's why I studied it so long. Even women who have been married to them for years and years and years aren't aware until somehow, and in these are particular cases, something happens and something gets exposed and then a whole complete other life is revealed. And they have spent their whole life living behind this mask. And even their wife and their children aren't aware. And then something happens. And how many of them do it all their lives and nobody ever becomes aware? They just die and people think they were the greatest things in sliced bread. Meanwhile, they had this whole other secret, filthy, disgusting life that they were living you know, on the side or in, in, in pockets of time that they took out from their, their main life. So when you say, oh, you know, so-and-so uh, is, you know, a new age guru and they seem so, oh, so they don't seem like a psychopath, so what's behind them? Could a psychopath be? If they're the one in charge, they're probably the psychopath. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, there are people who are manipulated. There are people who've been brainwashed. There are people who've been mind programmed. It's a smorgasbord of all kinds of things and you can't make a determination quickly you know you have to gather data gather data gather data you have to look into backgrounds that's one of the things that uh Hare and babiak did when they were doing their books snakes and suits it wasn't enough to just question the individual or to do a background check on them, which they would do, and they would search into their background, you know, uh, documents, public records types of things, doctor's rec, medical records, even psychiatric records if they could get them. And they would also go around and in the company that they worked work for and talk to people, to get them off and ask them about this person. And they would collect all of these profiles of the individual from many, many different people. And that's one really good way in a work environment to figure out who the psychopath is and what kind of trouble he's causing. Um, but honestly, it's it's very difficult with some of the really good ones, and there are some really good ones. But yes, they look they look into the the new age uh, organizations for places where they can plant themselves and grow all their little mushrooms all around them. Um, doctors, lawyers, psychiatrists, mainly uh, politicians is one of the biggest ones. And I mean, that's, that's why it's the way it is, because we have a political system that is such that it rewards this type of thing. It rewards what they do, the kinds of behaviors they exhibit. 
I mean, if if uh, if Congress people, the House of Repre- Representatives, or in the Senate, if they were limited to short terms, if they were required to live on the same, you know, the median salary of their constituents, if they didn't have all the different perks, if those were closed off to them, um, if they, uh, you know, basically were contained so that the only thing that could entice them to go into uh, government service would be government service, then, you know, the whole thing would change really, really, really fast. The, you know, government laws, everything would change really, really fast. But because it is the way it is, they get into power, they can, you know, they can be influential to pass a bill that favors this person or that person, so that person is going to give them a kickback. You know, they, they keep raising their salaries, they have special benefits, special insurance, they have, a, you know, a very large amount of money that they get, you know, for their living expenses when they're in, in Washington for Congress. Uh, they can get reelected year after year after year, so they can get scams going that they keep going for, you know, 25, 35, 45, 50 years. Uh, you know, lobbying, special interests, access, you know, to important people. It's designed to attract psychopaths. Absolutely. I want to know somewhere in there. It was bad enough for you that you left the United States. So at one point, you were working in the United States. You were working for the government. You saw how, you know, the difference between reality and what you were dealing with. But at some point, with what you were talking about, not just reading, the attacks became enough. For example, with you, I didn't know what country you were living in. And I won't say it now. Um, But it's not the USA. So... I say you left and you did not come back. Oh. Yeah, my husband was working for, uh, what do you call it, a subcontractor for DARPA. And he was working on uh, nuclear detection devices. And looking back now, I can see that these were the kinds of things that uh, they were looking already to put into place prior to 9-11 when they started getting all of these devices that you have to pass through in airports because it was similar to that. I mean, this was a handheld device and it actually worked. And uh, and it was not invasive and all that kind of stuff. And it, it detected the elements that needed to be detected without displaying the person's body. Mm-hmm. But of course, they went for the one that displays the body because that's more humiliating to the individual. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, he was there, and we didn't like it because we could we could feel the war drums going in the background, and we didn't. He didn't want to be giving his time, creative energy, and that sort of thing to things that would be used in uh, in any type of military uh, context, and. We were also in, having this terrible, this terrible time with all these people attacking because at this point I was writing articles about noticing the, the similarities between the diagnosis of, of psychopathy and people in government. And I would, you know, and I was, you know, recording the words they were saying from one day to the next, you know, as it was reported on television or the newspapers. And then pointing out how they said something else in another place, in another context, on another day, you know, the, the, how everything just was so bizarre. And I was even analyzing their speech because that's a big part of, of the study of psychopathy is speech analysis. Because they do use words in very particular ways because, you're, you know, your words represent or reflect the landscape of your mind. And whatever is most prominent in your mind or however your mind is wired to work will come out in your speech and they will uh, give themselves away to to a great extent in their speech and this is something that um, Hare writes about in his book Without Conscience and he gives some small examples there's a lot more literature on that subject uh, you know technical papers that have been written about, you know, the specific way that they use pronouns or their time references. Their time references are particularly interesting 
because it seems that they don't have a very good grasp of time. Uh, and this is one of the reasons, I, I think the ones who are more successful may have a better ability to uh, deal with time, but they don't seem to have the idea of consequences. You know, really, it, it, it doesn't, you know, stick with them. So they don't see that doing this now will lead to that later. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the big problems, actually, I think, with what's going on today. Because these people in power who are doing the things they are doing and claiming the things they are claiming do not realize the consequences of their actions. They don't. All they see is their immediate benefit, whatever it is, their immediate acquisition, whatever it happens to be. That's what they see, and they don't really understand the implication of the consequences that will inevitably, historical research will show you this is what's going to happen. History does repeat itself. I mean, maybe not exactly, but it repeats itself. You do this, this happens. They do not see it. And that's why it's really, really frightening because you can't understand why are they doing what they're doing? Because it leads to these bad consequences. And they've been doing that for a long time. And that's why we're in the state of bad consequences that we are in today. It's really, really terrible out there. And, and I mean, I keep track of it. I spend several hours a day, you know, seeing what's going on. It's terrible. I have another question then. I totally see what you're saying in terms of people employed by big pharma, people in the government, people in the media, no seeing consequences. On the other hand, what is happening I also see is done by people who see the consequences, not these people, not the person who's reporting a lie on the media and knows that they are blah, blah, blah. They're doing it because now they're a media star, because now they're a newscaster or whatever it happens to be. Or, you know, the pharma company has made $72 billion last year. Fine. But from everything I have read, and I am not an expert, but I am, like you, a questioner, I keep hearing about that there are definite long-term plans in place so that these people that you're talking about are not the top people. They are excellent people for carrying out someone else's long-term plan. Would that be something that goes with your thinking as well? Well, <clears throat> or your ob- observations, you might know more. Clearly there are long-term goals because bringing us to this point has apparently, based on all the research I've done and based on things that have come through in our channeling experiment, is planned. Mm-hmm. This, this chaos was planned. Yes. And the the individuals carrying it out are uh, carrying out the wishes of who? Mm-hmm. And I followed this trail, the, this line of thinking uh, some years ago, and I followed it. It may even have been back as early as 1999, 2000, I was thinking about this. And I followed every paper trail I could find. And you know, you come across all these different kinds of, you know, these esoteric conspiracies, you read through that, you read about the protocols of Zion, you go through that, uh, read about, you know, the people who have, they're kind of like whistleblowers or whatever, that they found out something and then they write a book about it. Um, and. Some and they all have like pieces, but who the heck is behind it? Mm-hmm. And I thought about it now. Psychopaths and other pathological types they, they generally function in a, in a in an economic kind of way. You know, it's cost benefit. You know, how much is this going to cost? How much is going to benefit me right now? You don't know. And I can't see them thinking about making the world a certain way for their offspring, their descendants. Because what they are actually doing is making things worse. 
for their offspring and their descendants. Mm -hmm. People like Bill Gates, he has children. He is creating a world that his children probably won't survive in, mm -hmm. or his grandchildren. And the same thing for many of these people in government. They are doing things in the world that are probably going to devour their children and grandchildren. See? So, you know, obviously, they're not thinking about it that way. So somebody is behind it who is wanting this to be the way it is, to, the way it is who is not concerned about that. And that was when I came to the conclusion that the only explanation for this long-term planning, and we're talking about multi-millennia, mm -hmm. not just the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a repeating thing. Was that there must be beings, entities, individuals who we are not aware of generally who have a vested interest in earth being brought to this state at this time mm -hmm. and you know the the most c common thing that people say is, is they call them like aliens well we don't call them aliens anymore we call them like ultra terrestrials there is something else that lives on this planet or inside this planet or around this planet or and it may be only a dimension away but it's in charge and Jacques Vallée called it you know the, the control system that there was some kind of intelligence and there's been enough research done on this you know to raise the hair on the back of your head you know get out the hairspray today and to just generally indicate that this is in fact the case we are at the mercy of beings that do not have our best interests at heart and that's really where you get to the bottom line and if you read my series the wave you know where i, I write about all of this you know i mean i it's like eight volumes i lay it out in exquisite detail and then uh, the, the volume high strangeness which is just you know kind of focusing on this whole alien abduction phenomenon you know to show that this is something that's not just you know some guys coming from outer space um and then um and so I'm, I'm laying all of that out there and it just seems self-evident once you get all of the pieces that there is something that has this aim and it's directing and it's global and it's directing people globally because now i mean you know like our channeling source said that world war ii was a trial run a practice run for what's happening to us today mm -hmm. and if and i mean that's really kind of a, a horrifying thing for them but they said it was going to be global mm -hmm. today so that's kind of what we're looking at. That is my sense as well. Not exactly who, what. I have less of a knowledge of that. And um, for myself, I never see more than one step. And so my next step that came to me on like the 3rd of April or so, or the 2nd, the day before my father's birthday, who is dead, was to do the Truth Summit. I don't know if it can do something because my thing is always things are not only about knowledge for me. Nor do I think it's only like, hey, I know this. I want to show off my knowledge for you at all. It has to do with much more than it has to do with expressing what you've learned through channeling, through research. <coughs> but it has to do in some way with connecting with the world. It, and in some way, if we know this, what can we do with it? So, well, I'll tell you, I don't know if you are familiar with what they call the normalcy bias. Yes, I am. Well, you know, they've done research and they say that in a terrible situation like a tornado is coming or in a plane crash, and those were the examples that were specifically used in the, in the book. Uh, God, I wish I could remember the name of the book. Can you hold on just a second and I will tell you? Sure. I've got a, 
I have the name of the book written. You Are Not So Smart. That's the name of the book, and it's by David McRaney. And uh, they talk about the tendency to flounder in the face of danger. Um, and they call it negative panic. Um, anyway, the whole thing about it is, is that um, in any dire situation, about 75% of the people succumb to this panic. And about 15% on the other end of the of this bell curve, or this, or this scale, you know, are reduced to blithering idiots. You know, there's blah, 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 because they can't handle it. And at the other end, there are people who can do something. And the people, it turns out, who are able to do something in these crisis situations are people who have thought about it. Are not maybe specifically this situation, but crisis situations in general have thought and have or have interacted with people who have experienced it, have discussed it, have, uh, you know, have some idea that, you know, that there is this these terrible things and that you may need to do something to survive. You may need to act. You may need to act instantly. You may need to at that point, you know, lose your your uh, your your concern about what people are going to think of you and do what has to be done because it's the right thing to do. There's about 15 percent of people who can do that. And we are seeing this all around us, you know, there are, because people are warning, people are warning, warning, this is coming, this is what's happening, this is what's happening. And 75% of the people are not doing anything. And 75% of the people are probably going to, I mean, I would say 75% is how many, how many took that COVID vaccine, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, uh, I think that I think I read something a statistic something like that like 75% of the planet's population took the covid vaccine. And, you know, I mean that's that's just nuts. So uh survivors of any dreadful situation generally have thought about dreadful situations. They have and and here we're here we're start talking specifically about evil. Mhm. Mm Surviving evil. And I think the analogy can be transferred to surviving evil. Because if you see that you're confronted with evil on a global scale or, or on a national scale, it's in, the, it's in the House of Representatives, it's in the Senate, it's in the, it's in the White House. You know, and you need to do something. You, don't, you shouldn't be sitting there freezing because, you know, I mean, that freeze response is natural. People freeze in, this, in the face of a crisis or, or a terrible situation because they just, they just can't do otherwise. It's, it's ingrained. It's, it's hereditary. It's, it's what they call evolutionary, the freeze response. That's why a deer freezes in the headlight when you're coming at him with a car. It's like, Ugh. you know, that's what people are doing. They're going, Ugh. And I mean, you go on Twitter and every day, day after day, you know, arrest Biden, arrest Hunter Biden, arrest Hillary Clinton, arrest Bill Clinton, arrest Barack Obama, arrest George Bush, um, you know, on and on and on, you know, the, the kind of the figureheads of the <laughs> systemic evil. I mean, there's a whole slew of them in Congress and in the Senate. And a whole slew of them on the local level and local governments. Because, you know, when those kind of people get in power, they tend to start doing favors for people who are like them. Mm -hmm. They get them jobs. And over a period of, say, 50 years after, you know, these kinds of people have taken control, probably every important position in every government office or every corporate office has been filled by somebody who has pathological tendencies. Mm-hmm. I mean, we are faced with a huge systemic evil that is so overwhelming. And yet, at the same time, when you think about it, it's still a small percentage of the population. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The people at the top, it's a very small percentage. That is why I think that the percentages are not ac you know, accurate. to the, And there are always people on borders 
between one group and another group. And that's where I see people like us coming in, that they're people at the borders who might move from one group to another. Somebody put together 12 rules for survival in extreme situations. And I forget the name. But rule number one is perceive and believe. So the yep. 75% are going, arrest Trudeau, arrest Biden. They're like stuck on, ha like hamsters on a wheel, as opposed to what can I do right now locally here? It's also what can somebody else do? Because they're not arresting Biden. So they're stuck on something that I see totally unproductive. So the thing is, how many of those are movable in some ways? So that, you know, because the figures aren't absolutely 75%, etc. etc. So what, what do you think they should do? What do I, I, I think find something local to do. Like I'm doing this. It's not about arresting well, Trudeau yes. or something. So what it does is it gets more people to become somewhat aware. Yeah, it gets the awareness out. That's what I'm doing. And I've always known that that's, mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing I can do. You know, come on, I'm 70. And then I talk to people. But I will throw it back to you because you may be way ahead of me on this. I said I'm a next step person. Oh, you're looking like I don't know all the answers either. No. God, but it's just like if we just know. If I were younger. Mm-hmm. I would do differently, obviously. I mean, like I just said, I'm 71 years old. Um, I I have still some research work that needs to be done before I check out, so I, I need to be getting about that. Because there is, I mean, it, it, read my book from Paul to Mark, and you'll understand. Um, but ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, Historically speaking, it's going to come to extreme violence. Mm -hmm. And what worries me about that is, is whenever that happens, it's usually like the pendulum swinging the other way. And it just gets bad in, in another way. It, I mean, they... I mean, look at the French Revolution, look at all the, the, the important, valuable people, minds that they executed that they shouldn't have, uh, innocent people, you know, I mean, how immediately the idea of chopping people's heads off, you know, appealed to the psychopaths and says, yeah, let's do that. And here, I got a list of people I want you to chop their heads off because I can, you know, take their... You their got good. my enemies, time to yeah. get my revenge. Yeah, so, I mean, that kind of thing always always results in just not the right thing to do and then it restarts everything on a wrong foundation so i mean if there were someone who could who could control this needed movement who could encompass it who could direct it and who was not himself a pathological individual, you know, that would be something that might turn things around because we're basically trying to turn an ocean mm -hmm. launch around. Yes. And they're not easy to turn around. They don't turn around fast. And, you know, there is no one. You know, I well, that's the one thing I cannot accept, that there is no one. It doesn't seem plausible to seen, me. Have you seen anybody? No, uh, just a moment. Laura, that I have not seen anybody does not prove nobody exists. Um, so my sense is that I don't know that person. As far as possible in my itsy way, I try to be such a person for people around me. Well, I'm talking about big scale. You I know, I know you're talking about it in a way, way larger scale, in a way, way larger place. Um, I mean, Donald Trump, he's, he's kind of interesting. He's done some interesting things. But he's a businessman. He's got a certain agenda. He's got a certain focus, you know. But he's not going to fix everything. 
No. Uh, I don't know. I do not know. What I do hold out hope for or belief in is that there is a possibility. You know, so that's the one thing is I don't know who that person is, but I believe it is possible that that person exists. Yeah, and like you said, the local level, if you go out on the local level and you talk to people and you, you know, get people together, have meetings, talk about things, at least you're talking about the evil and making it evident to people and making them aware so that if something really dramatic happens, you know, they'll at least be ready to not be the deer in the headlights. So, you know, to take, now is the moment to take action and they'll know it. That to me is something, and yeah, and we have our we have our forum. You know, we got mm -hmm. multiple thousands of members. You know, constant discussions on everything. Uh, my husband's got a blog. Um, we have our Science of the Times website. I don't know if you've been there, but that's that's been our kind of our focus for a lot of time is to is to get the news, present the news, and truthify it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read it or not, but you, you just you just go to SOTT dot net. Yes, I know it. I found yeah. a lot of things there. Yeah, so we just take the mainstream news mm -hmm. and a lot of news that we get from alternative sources and even from individuals around mm -hmm. the world. You know, it's all kind of mixed together, but um, you know, kind of juxtaposing it together so that people can see what the real deal is or as close to the real deal as we can get at the moment you know, because sometimes you can't get any further than than a, a certain distance knowing what's going on because so much is hidden um but we try to do that and we have a lot of readers there and then we have our forum we just spend our time really working on trying to spread information and knowledge and doing the research so that we have it to give to other people because like I was going to tell you a while back, you know, back when we started our website, my husband and I sat down and we talked about it. And he said, he says, well, you know, we have found each other. And what brought us together was our search for truth, mm -hmm. you know, seeking for truth and our love of truth. Mm -hmm. And he says, what if there aren't any others? And I sat there and I thought about that real possibility because in, you know, basically in my whole life up to that point, I was 44 years old. I had not encountered somebody who felt the same way about truth that I did. Of all my acquaintances, all my associates, people I'd worked with, nobody, nobody felt the way about it that I did, you know, that it was like a passion. And I looked at him and I says, well... You know, if it's just you and me, then it's just you and me. We, we keep on doing it. We just keep on doing it. Because it deserves to be done. The universe deserves it. I mean, it would be a shame for the universe to end and nobody to have existed who loved truth and tried their hardest. You know, the impossible dream. You know, da -da -da. You know I feel like singing a song here. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> music you know, is great. Who who actually dedicated their lives to finding the truth and propagating the truth and sharing it with as many people as possible. And, and actually, in a sense, doing that is, is like putting out, uh, you know, a meal and seeing, you know, who wants to come, who's really hungry. Because if there are other people who want truth, you know, then you attract them and then you, you know, because we wanted to meet others who cared too. <laughs> And, of course, we did. We have. There are many. We have a, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, group on our forum. And they, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been really worth the pain and the suffering. I think but, that's amazing. And if you look at what you've done, it's not two people now. How many thousand? You said on SOTnet? We have thousands on our forum. Uh, I, I don't. I don't even know the number of readers of Sotnet. Um, mm -hmm. Thousands, and you know, we have meetings. We get. We help people get together. We 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 curate everything mm -hmm. so that we can help people to get together and meet safely because we are aware of pathological individuals trying to infiltrate groups and create problems or prey on people. So we we try to 
to you know manage that so that people can actually get together in real life mm -hmm. safe so we do that a great deal and uh so that's um that's what we're doing and that's what we will continue to do and as far as I think that people should just be getting together and talking about it and I you know I, I hesitate to say anything more than that because you know the right person with the right idea will find the right group of people and they'll know what to do I guess is the best yeah. way to say it because um, I want to thank you for talking to me I've really appreciated your story and so I want to thank you and do you have any last words to people? Any advice, ideas, anything at all? Well, I, th I think you just said it. You know, somebody who has an example, who sets an example of, of, you know, continuing on doing what is right, what is the thing to do in the face of, you know, everybody uh, being against you. That's never been something that has stopped me. The fact that people have been against me, it has, in fact, it fuels me. Uh, you know, because if I've done the research and I am um, sure of my position, as sure as I can be, and I will always qualify it and say I've done the research and I'm sure of this position as far as it can be determined. Mm -hmm. you know, but because I don't, I don't do the, the whole psychopathic go, oh, this is the way it is, you know, that sort of thing. No, people should just keep doing and and practicing and learning because you don't want to be the deer caught in the headlights and that's what happens to 75 percent of people the odds are not good mm -hmm. so people need to make sure that they are not included in that 75 percent grouping you know become aware that's the main thing become aware and the only way you can do that is with knowledge and the only way knowledge grows is with truth that's the bottom line yeah I agree with you and thank you ever so much. You are welcome and I thank you for calling me. Well, when I came across you, I really believe in following a trail. When I came across you, I went, whoa, double interest both in her own journey and then that you were willing to deal with underlying evil in terms of getting us to understand what is going on. Not in terms of having the answers, but yeah. in terms of being willing to ask the question and being willing to look. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, your interest in Islam is, is curious. I, I think you really might enjoy reading my book from Paul to Mark because, you know, if, if there was no Jesus as he was presented, then there is no Islam. And what is the book? It's called From Paul to Mark. From Paul to Mark. Right, I read about that book because I read about all your re all the books you've written and stuff like that. That one is probably my masterpiece and it's uh it's on Amazon. And uh it I mean the work of several other scholars has, has basically undercut the whole Old Testament story as well. So once you take away the Old Testament and the way the New Testament is put together, then it takes away Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Et voilà. It doesn't mean there's not spirituality. It doesn't mean there's not God. It doesn't mean that mm -hmm. it does. And I'm careful to navigate that in this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely, because those other things are like, in fact, I think the religions in their manifestations are there because there is Something. spirituality and they're because there is, I call it cosmic energy or cosmic energies or you can call it whatever you like, but it's because that exists and because there is our capacity to connect with it, that's why we have religion. That's yeah, my right. understanding. Yeah, well, I think I found pretty good evidence, and, and I put it all in the book and explained everything, uh, that there was a real reason mm -hmm. for the beginning of Christianity, and Paul was the one who basically began Christianity, 
and that uh, the Gospel of Mark was written to explicate Paul's teachings, and the people who came along later mistook this metaphorical story for the truth. Mm. Okay.